this is our second to last colloquium of the semester. If you come back next week, you'll have a peaceful time because you'll be the only one. In two weeks, our last talk will be by our own Dr. Isabella Kanana, who will be speaking about the distinguishing number and the distinguishing chromatic number of graphs. So we'll come back to that last talk this semester. Today, I'm happy to introduce our speakers, Eric Barkin and David Sklar. David will actually be doing most of the speaking, and Eric will be correcting and pivoting as needed. Um, Eric and David met in 1966 when they were both engineering students at the age of five at Cooper Union <laughs> in New York City. Thank you. <laughs> Eric went on to study physics and David mathematics. Uh, Eric spent his career working in the optical industry, and David spent about half of his career teaching, including uh, two years at Sonoma State, 1978 to 1980 and half working with Eric in the optical industry. Uh, they developed fundamental mathematical models for three familiar optical technologies, Braille lenses, barcode scanners, and progressive multifocal lenses. We might have some of those progressive <laughs> lenses in the room, but I don't, that, well, I don't know. You're, you're Most thoughtful. people are too young. Yeah. <laughs> there are a few of us. And, and you're all familiar with barcode scanners. Um, they're co-inventors on a number of US and international patents. Eric and David have different but overlapping interests in mathematics and physics, and they're currently working in the history of mathematics, specifically on Riemann's contributions to analytic number theory. So that's what they're going to tell us about today, Riemann, Ziegel, and the zeros of Zeta. I hope you welcome David. Well, thank you. It's uh, nice to be back at Sonoma State. And since, of course, we've included uh, we have enough material for several hours to talk. I think I'll, I'll get started and talk as fast as I can. Feel free to interrupt uh, with questions, though, at any time. And I'll either try and answer, Eric will try and answer, or will tell you to see us after the talk. So, OK. So <clears throat> just for a little mathematical background, almost everything we're going to talk about is uh, what happened? It's on two of three. Really? Do we have to do something with the? Uh, no. Oh, it's cut it off is. the top. Okay. All right, I'm going to do it quick. Is there something you have to do here to get it to recognize? Uh, probably not. Let me. Okay. Okay. Good. Now get it full screen again. Yeah, we'll try that part. Let's see if that works. OK. Well, all right. We'll start with this, then, since it's here. So almost everything we're going to talk about has to do with the distribution of primes. That's what Riemann attacked, the problem Riemann attacked in uh, <clears throat> 1859 was uh, concerning the distribution of primes. And so we introduce a function, the prime counting function, pi of x is the number of primes less than or equal to x. And I think as we can see from the graph here, it's 0 between 0 and 2. At 2, it jumps up 1. Right? So we have 1 prime less than or equal to 2. 1 less than or equal uh, Yes, at, five, at 3, it jumps up again, 5, 7, and so on. So it takes a step up at every prime. And uh, <clears throat> well, it's a function. It has a graph. It's um, it captures right, the dis our notion of the distribu distribution of primes in terms of a function. And that, you know, anytime we have a function in graphs, we have the possibility of using the tools of analysis. And, um, and we're really going to use them here. Right? <laughs> so, that's, um, so mostly this talk is history. As uh, Ben mentioned, Eric and I have ended up here in the history of mathematics. We've ended up in lots of odd places over the years intellectually. And, um, yeah, so this is the story of, really, the story of two mathematicians, Bernard Riemann, who lived a uh, 19th century mathematician, 1826 to 1866. He's famous for a number of really important things that are still used in the uh, 21st century. Um, <clears throat> he was a prolific mathematician. He died young. He was 39 years old. His contribution to number theory consists, published anyway, consists of one eight-page paper. But it's, uh, it revolutionized the subject, and still is in some sense. So we'll 
we'll look at that. And, uh, <clears throat> and then a great 20th, 20th century analyst and number theorist, uh, Carl Ludwig Siegel, who uh, <clears throat> right, his dates are 1896 to 1981. He was in the US during the Second World War and for a little period uh, surrounding it. And he went back to Germany and I believe he finished his career at Göttingen. So he, uh, after studying at Göttingen, he was um, an important member of the Department of Frankfurt, which was a new department that started in 1922. And these guys collaborated on the result we'll probably get to with about a minute or two to go in the talk. But it'll be coming up. So here's a brief historical introduction. So Riemann published his one paper in number theory in 1859. And in the paper, he obtained an explicit formula, a sort of a quote, analytic formula for the prime counting function, something that involves you know, algebra, integrals, sums, that sort of thing. Right? Um, <clears throat> He also revealed the deep connection between the distribution of primes and the zeros of a certain analytic function that we now call the Riemann zeta function. We'll talk about that too. And in that paper, he stated the Riemann hypothesis, which concerns the zeros of the zeta function and is, I guess, the most famous unsolved problem in mathematics today. It's worth a million dollars from the Clay Foundation. If anyone finishes a proof before the end of the talk, just bring it up for <laughs> all interested. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then, so 1859, Riemann. Um, in his rough notes, he had, a, he had discovered an asymptotic expansion of the zeta function, uh, an expansion that allows one to evaluate the zeta function, estimated quite accurately for large values of the argument. Um, it was discovered in Riemann's private notes by Siegel, and Siegel published his uh, explanation of what he found there in a famous paper in 1932. It's a 35-page paper. It's extremely terse. It was written for Hardy and Landau and the other professional analytic number theorists of the age. It gave Eric and I a very hard time. But, uh, <laughs> but we, we have worked our way through it. Anyway, this, the representation that he found is today known as the Riemann-Siegel formula. That's what I'm going to get to in the last five minutes, maybe a statement. And it remains our primary tool for numerical investigation of the zeta function. Siegel's paper showed, by the way, that in analytic number theory anyway, Riemann was at least 70 years ahead of his time. So between 1859 and Riemann's discovery of the formula, a lot happened in analytic number theory. But by 1932, this asymptotic expansion was groundbreaking and revolutionary. And you know, people talk about so-and-so being ahead of their time, but Riemann really was, if you have a proof that he was 70 years ahead of his time, that's uh, quite remarkable. Oh, and by the way, it took a great mathematician of the 20th century to sort it out, too. And you, we'll, we'll show you a little bit about what he had to work with. Um, yeah, so how did Eric and I get involved with this? Well. We've used the Riemann-Siegel formula. We derived it, read some very nice, uh, a very nice expository uh, uh, derivation of, of it in uh, Harold Edwards' book, Riemann Zeta Function. Um, and I guess last October, we were kicking it around again. You know, it would be nice to know just what Siegel did and just what Riemann did. But um, the derivations, the expositions, don't tell you that. Siegel's paper, as I said, was rather terse, so it was, but the result was so important, it was immediately explained elsewhere. And uh, so we decided to go look at Siegel's paper, and I went online to find a translation, download a PDF, something that you can usually do in a half an hour these days. And it didn't exist online. And um, so even though it's cited in every, every time the Riemann Siegel formula comes up, uh, we couldn't find an English translation, so we've translated it. We have a draft translation of the paper. We found it in Siegel's collected works. And uh, we're working on a carefully annotated version. But if anyone's interested, you can email us and get our 
current draft and our current notes too. So we're happy to share it. So um, yes, and since October we've been really just embedded in this stuff. It's what, what we've been doing, and it's actually been a lot of fun. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So in the presentation we'll discuss some of what we learned during this uh, whole process. Okay. So first, a little mathematics and history. Um, <coughs> So the distribution of primes before Riemann's 1859 paper. The first uh, yeah, real result along these uh, lines were conjectures by Gauss in 1793 as a 15-year-old, I think, and later Legendre, who was always a little behind Gauss, even though he was 20 years older and an established mathematician. It's tough having uh, Gauss as a competitor. Um, <coughs> They conjectured, the idea was to look for <coughs> some simple way to estimate the prime counting function. How many, you know, how many primes are there less than x? And, and they suggested that the function x over log x, which grows um, you know, a little slower than x. Of course, not every number is a prime. x wouldn't be that good an estimator. Um, <coughs> would be x over log x. And conjectured that if you look at the limit as x goes to infinity, that the ratio of these would converge to 1. So the um, percent error would go to 0. Um, and when our two functions behave this way, that their ratio goes to 1 for large values, we say that the functions are asymptotically equal. So in, in that terminology notation here. In that language, pi of x is asymptotically equal to x over log x. So this conjecture right, uh, became called the prime number theorem. Um, <clears throat> yes, preparatory to a, uh, a result along these lines by Dirichlet, I think, in 1838, and we will see it in a minute. We need a uh, well-known function, but probably not uh, the students here, called the log integral function. And uh, it's called Li of x. And it's the integral from 0 to x of dt over log t. Now, because there's some problems here, both at uh, a little problem at 0, but that's easy, because that's integrable. And you guys should be able to sort that out. Um, but at log t, of course, it's more complicated. That's at, at 1, sorry. At, when t equals 1, log of t is, is 0. And um, yes, you, the calcu calculus and that real analysis students should be able to show that the limits don't exist. You get a different limit yeah, from the right and left. You don't get it. But if you take the limits symmetrically about 1, you know, like, like integrating 1 over x through 0 by just coming in symmetrically, everything cancels. and that function is called the log integral function. And it turns out to actually be, if you don't want to worry about the singularities, it's just the integral from, say, 2 to x plus a constant. We're only interested for large values anyway. So, um, and this is a very nice function. And uh, yeah, Dirichlet in 1838 um, uh, showed that uh, or pointed out that lo the log integral function, Li of x, provides a better estimate in some sense than x over log x. But asymptotically, these are all equivalent. Pi of x, that's harder to show, but Li of x and x over log x. And uh, yeah, it's a nice calculus exercise. You can attack the ratio and the limit directly and have some fun. Um, I have a little note here about Hints, do you want hints or should we? <laughs> okay, if anyone works on it, we, we, we have two hints. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and the last sort of result along these lines about pi of x before Riemann is Chebyshev in 1851. And he showed that if the limit exists, that's the hard part, it turns out showing that that limit actually exists. But Chebyshev showed that if it does exist, then it's 1. So we're still left with that. 
an existence problem. Okay. So we're going to prove all this right now with pictures. Well, maybe proof is too strong a statement. So here's pi of x out to 1,000. You see now, you know, it, out to 1,000, it does look pretty regular. And uh, notice the different scales. It's not quite straight. It seems to be, you know, a little bit concave down. Um, so here's x over log x. We didn't say they stayed close, but just that their ratio goes to 1. They could, in fact, get infinitely far apart, and the ratio could still get to go to one. But um, I don't know whether that happens or not. And then the log integral that Dirichlet pointed out, that, that does seem quite a bit nicer, um, staying closer at least for small values, if we consider x less than 1,000 small. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of stories we could tell about both of these, but I think later, maybe over dinner. Okay. Um, and then here's another function due to Riemann. Right? It's a piece of his work, of his formula that we're going to get to, the smooth piece of his formula. Um, so we call it pi smooth here. We call it several things along the way. Sorry about that. But um, the red one there, and that's, uh, that's very nice. So this is, that's, uh, so that's Riemann. And, uh, We'll look at what that function is shortly. Okay. okay, so back to the history. In 1859, Riemann published his paper, his eight-page paper on the number of primes less than a given magnitude. Yeah. And his goal in the paper um, was not to prove the prime number theorem. I think if you do searches online, I, I had some student papers that you know, wrote papers on parts of this history. They always, what they said about Riemann's paper and what they found was that he didn't succeed in proving the prime number theorem, but he introduced some important methods. Well, it's true that he introduced some important methods. It's true that he didn't prove the prime number theorem, but he wasn't trying to prove the prime number theorem. In fact, if you read it carefully and get really involved in it, it's not clear that Riemann couldn't have proved the prime number theorem had he wanted to. That wasn't his goal. His goal was to find a formula for pi of x, what he was thinking of as a, quote, analytic formula. And uh, he succeeded pretty well. It did take some, a little bit of filling in. But, uh, and it took a long time to actually understand what he'd done. But uh, yeah. And his, his formula can be regarded as a sort of Fourier decomposition of pi of x. So those of you who've done a little bit with trigonometric series, some pictures here will look familiar. But they'll look suggestive anyway. And, uh, <clears throat> Right, where the frequencies are determined by the complex zeros of the zeta function. And in this way, he linked the distribution of primes to the zeros of the zeta function. We'll explore all of this in a little more detail. This paper also contains the Riemann hypothesis, the conjecture that the complex, by complex zeros here, I mean the function zeta is a function that takes complex numbers as arguments. By a complex zero, this isn't great uh, terminology. I mean a complex number that isn't a real number, okay, that doesn't lie on the real axis, and takes on the and the zeta function takes on the value zero when you drop it in. Okay, so that's what we mean by a complex zero of the zeta function. And Riemann conjectured that all of those lie on a vertical line in the complex plane with real part equal one half. Yes, so that's the Riemann hypothesis, essentially as stated in Riemann. He stated it slightly differently. But oh, yes. Yes, right. Well, yes, up here. Eric pointed out, yes. We call that vertical line the critical line. And the Riemann hypothesis is that all the uh, complex or non-trivial zeros lie on that critical line. Um, in the paper, he says that uh, he doesn't have a proof a lot of the things he states in the paper, uh, it's not quite clear whether he has a proof whether, um, or whether it's a conjecture. But this one, he states very clearly um, that he uh, made a few fleeting vain attempts, I think is what the translation uh, uh, would be, um, but that it would not be nice to see a proof that they all do lie on that line. And we still feel that way. 
it would be, it would be nice to see a proof of that. Okay. Siegel's 1932 discovery that we mentioned before and publication of the asymptotic formula for zeta that uh, Riemann had found in 1859. I just revolutionized the numerical investigation of zeta and s for complex s and, uh, and so revolutionized the numerical work on the Riemann hypothesis. Um, so we know that a lot of zeros fall on the line. We haven't found one that doesn't. Um, Riemann himself found the first three as you go up the line. Yes, that, that's right, using the Riemann-Siegel formula. Um, this didn't appear in the paper, and people who read Riemann's paper, um, uh, no one, it didn't occur to anyone that he might have actually computed some, or how he did. Um, it was a long time before anyone computed a zero. Um, anyway, using the Riemann-Siegel formula and some very nice, uh, a very nice algorithm due to old Zisko and Schoenhager, um, Gordon in 2004 verified that the first 10 to the 13th zeros as we go up all lie on the line. Uh, but still there are a lot of integers after 10 to the 13th, so we'd like a proof. Um, okay, so now I'll try and, we, yes, we had hoped to talk about Siegel's paper, but you can't talk about Siegel's paper without giving some background on Riemann's paper from 1859, and I think most of the talk will probably be that, but it's, hopefully you'll be interested anyway. So, so the Riemann zeta function, zeta of s, um, <coughs> is central to analytic number theory. Um, and yes, I, I don't think I've ever seen it defined any other way, but for the real part of, for s, for complex numbers whose real part is greater than one, there's a nice series which had been studied before actually by Euler, uh, the sum of one over n to the s. And yeah, for those of you who are not comfortable with complex numbers, think of s being a real number. It's perfectly okay. Right? If you, in calculus, this would have been p series, right? And you learn that p series converge if p is greater than or equal to one. And it turns out complex numbers work much the same way as far as series go. And if the real part is greater than one, then this would converge to the complex number. So it defines a nice function of a complex variable on that right half plane. Um, an analytic function, a function that can be expanded in a Taylor series about every point in its in a neighborhood of every point in its domain. Very smooth, very nice function. Okay. Um, Riemann <coughs> needed more than that. Uh, notice the uh, the critical line isn't in this uh, domain, <laughs> for example. So Riemann had, he, he needed a, a better version of this function. Um, ah, well, I, yes, well, as I mentioned, Euler had studied this and he had actually evaluated this for a bunch of integer values of s, in particular for all the even integers. He became famous for evaluating zeta of two which turned out to be pi squared over six. Yes, and, uh, but in fact, for S, any even integer, Euler had evaluated them, so he didn't. But he wasn't thinking of the function in the way Riemann was at all. Um, <clears throat> though, yes, yeah, certainly not for complex arguments, though probably for real arguments, but he didn't, his work didn't uh, involve that. Um, what Riemann did was <clears throat> he extended the domain, right? what's called analytic continuation. He provided the unique analytic continuation of the zeta function. He found a, an analytic function that, whose domain was the entire complex plane, very smooth analytic function whose domain was the entire complex plane except for one point at the real number one, it has a pole. So it's not, it's not nice there, but it's about as nice as you can be when you're not nice <laughs> for, a, uh, for a function. It's, it just looks like one over x or one over s near that 
1 over s minus 1, I guess. But, um, <clears throat> and uh, so he found this very nice function that gives exactly the same values as the series for real part of s greater than 1, but is now defined everywhere. So it's this global function that um, we now call the Riemann zeta function, or Riemann's zeta function. And uh, <clears throat> yes, and so now with the domain extended here, the critical line is in it. Everything's in it except one. And uh, yeah, so here's a picture of the domain and some key pieces here. So over here to the right of one, we can compute it using the series. Okay. Riemann uh, gave us this analytic continuation, which is defined everywhere. We have this pole here at one. Um, yes, it, and of course his work, right? Yeah, and so this, the whole rest over here is the region that he continued it into. Um, he didn't do it the way those of you who've taken a course in complex variables learn to do it by expanding series and things. He, he used a, he, he did it in several ways, but one was a, his key way to get started was he used a contour integral representation of the function and showed that it agreed with the series here and was itself defined everywhere. So it was uh, simple. Um, yeah, and it wasn't hard to show that there were zeros at the negative even integers. They're now called the trivial zeros. They're not uninteresting, and they're not really all that trivial, but in this, in this sense, they are. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, and then here we have the, uh, yeah, so here and the usual terminology is the non-trivial zeros. I was calling them the complex zeros before. And uh, yeah, at least the first 10 to the 13th lies along the line. Each, the comp given as zero of the zeta function, its complex conjugate is also a zero. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so, we, yeah, so, th so they come in pairs, nice pairs, and um, yeah, and so far they do all lie on the line, but yes, Riemann found, though he made an arithmetic mistake, I think, for rho sub two, um, and so his accuracy wasn't too good, but basically he found the first three, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit of history of the computation. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's it for here. So this is our function. Oh yeah, the output values, so the inputs are any complex number here, and the output values are complex numbers in general. We're particularly interested in when the output is zero. But, um, yeah, so looking at just a couple of cross sections, I couldn't get a good picture of the graph of the, uh, of the Riemann zeta function because it, it's in four dimensions, for one thing, right? To put the domain point, which is a two-dimensional thing. And, but I couldn't get a good graph of the absolute value either, but maybe somebody wants to make one. But if we just look along the real line, um, right, we have the, the pole at one, where it blows up. And yeah, it really does look like, you know, one over x minus one there. And um, yeah, no zeros over here. And just about see it wiggling around. You see a couple of zeros there. But if we look along the critical line and evaluate the zeta function, then it has a real part and an imaginary part. So we're just using the idea that a complex number z you could write as x plus i y. The real part of z would be x, and the y would be the imaginary part of z. And so now we're looking at zeta along the line, real part equal one half, so as t goes up, the, uh, we have two, one variable real graphs, one for the um, imaginary part, the blue one, and the red one for the real part. And yeah, so the real part has lots of zeros, so does the imaginary part, but we have a zero only if they're both zeros. 
real F part and the imaginary part. And so here's, here's the first few we talked about, one around 14, one around 21, one around 25. It starts to get kind of messy, though. It's really, OK. So Riemann starts his 1859 paper with a famous formula due to Euler, um, Euler's product identity. And uh, Euler had observed the following sort of consequence of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, that if you look at 1 minus 1 over the first prime, 2 to the s, and you, look, and you multiply that by 1 over 1 minus 1 over 3 to the s, 5, and so on. And you look at this product over all the primes, so the next term would be 7, the next 11, and so on, that the function you get with that infinite product is exactly the same function that you get with this series. And of course, what this does is it re Yes, this shows us the connection between the zeta function and the prime numbers. So this goes back to Euler's identity, um, 1730s probably. So we have a connection between the primes and, and the zeta function through Euler. Riemann <clears throat> has his analytic continuation of the series here. So he has his global um, zeta function, right, which um, is the same uh, where the series is valid, real part of s equal 1. And he derives a bunch of important properties, including a functional equation, which plays a key role, some, a couple of representations, integral representations of the zeta function, which give, provide not necessarily great ways to evaluate it when you're not, uh, when you can't use the series, when you're in another part of the domain, but um, he provides them in the paper. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, using these, <clears throat> these properties, and I can't say more than that, uh, at this point with the paper, though, how he does it is wonderful. It's just an amazing, an amazing paper. But he uses the properties that he got and uh, the Euler formula, the Euler product uh, relationship to get his formula for, the, uh, for pi of x. So this is his formula. <laughs> yes, the first question should be, oh, OK, what's r of x? Mm -hmm. right? And so, and what's rho? And I think everything else should make, look okay there, right? Okay. So r of x is itself, it's a nice function. It's, uh, it's an infinite series of the log integral function that we, involving the log integral function that we uh, talked about before. We'll, we'll repeat the definition, but, um, <clears throat> and it's the log integral minus one half times the log integral of x to the one half minus one third. It turns out the series is very nicely behaved. It converges uniformly, absolutely and uniformly. So it's a very nice, smooth function, r of x. No. Yes. No, that's the that's j in the inversion. The inversion. Yes. Different function. No, this is an infinite series. It is infinite. Okay. Um, though, as n gets large, the root gets for large for yeah, it's still the let yeah the root gets closer and closer to one. But it's you know it's small anyway. It's an infinite series. And uh, yes, the signs here mu of n is a well familiar number theoretic function for those of you who've taken. Um, of course, in number theory, I'll just tell you what it is um, now. Um, yeah, so you want to evaluate mu at n. You first need to get the prime factorization of n, right? And then see that there has no square factors. None of the primes appear to a power of two or greater. If they do, it's zero. Otherwise, it's minus one to the number of distinct prime factors. 
And it plays an important role in elementary number theory. It's one of the first functions you'll see. It enables one to get some very nice inversion formulas. So if you know one number theoretic function, you can get another, but we, we're not gonna get into that. Um, really, our point here is that this is a very nice function, okay? It's a smooth function. And just a re reminder about Li of x, it's just the integral of one over log t dt plus constant. Okay, but yeah, we can think of the formula in two parts. That first, the first four terms there, uh, three terms. And these are, yes, I said that th this is a nice smooth function. So are these. In fact, these become unimportant as x gets large enough because they both go to zero. And, um, yeah, and this is a smooth, strictly monotonic function for x greater than 2. And then the, ah, uh, yes, I, and I should yeah, say that there's no way we couldn't have, I mean, we really need another term because pi of x is not a smooth function, right? It has discontinuities, so we need something else that will get those for us, right? And we might have found that if you, take the sum of, if you evaluate r at x to the rho, right, where rho is a zero of the zeta function, okay, a non-trivial zero, the one in the critical strip, and then you sum over all of those uh, in the proper order, okay, okay, uh, yes, this sum does not converge nicely. It's a conditionally convergent series, so it matters what order you sum it in. Calculus two, right? And um, <clears throat> in fact, a conditionally convergent series can be a rearranged to sum to whatever you want by just rearranging the terms. So Riemann told us exactly how to do it. He said, um, <clears throat> take the first zero, go up, take the first zero, and it's complex conjugate. Take the next one and it's complex conjugate. If you sum in that order, you get pi of x. You get the bumps. You get the bumps. And this whole right hand side is pi of x. Okay. And you might mention that the first part is the smooth curve we showed earlier. We're gonna show it again. Oh we show it again. Yes, right now. So um, <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, so we now have the connection of the zeros via the sum of the zeta function to the prime numbers. Okay. And uh, so Euler gave us the connection of the zeta function to the primes. Riemann gives us the connection of the zeros of the zeta function to the, uh, um, and now I'm going to try this. I'm going to escape, go here. So here I'm not looking out to 1,000, just to 20 to see what's going on. And this is the smooth part, right? r of x plus those other two terms that involve the octan and the log. And this was the red graph that we showed you before at the, near the beginning of the talk. It really is a nice smooth fit to, the, uh, to pi of x. But now, <clears throat> and we haven't put in any of the zeros the terms that correspond to the zeros. If we put in the first pair, so the one at 14 and minus 14, and add that in, right, we get this function. We put in at 20 and minus, uh, 21 minus 21 also, we get this and so on. The first 10, the first 20, <coughs> we're getting the jumps. So in that sense, Riemann found a formula for pi of x. It involves infinite series, integrals, but analy an analysis. And if we keep doing, keep going, 100 zero pairs, you see, we really do get the jumps. And those of you who've seen Fourier um, series converging to well, usually square waves and stuff, you then add a increasing function, you would get Fourier uh, series can, can get you step functions. But of course, it involves equally spaced frequencies and various things that we don't have here. But um, in fact, the frequencies are 
the imaginary parts of the complex zeros. And uh, we'll uh, take a look at that. Um, the convergence is, it can't be uniform convergence. How come? Anyone, anyone had a real analysis course? Yeah, great, exactly. So we knew it couldn't be, but it is pointwise. And these little ears, they just keep moving back till they essentially vanish. Okay, I'm gonna get out of here, back to uh, the real work. Okay, I'm gonna do this quickly. A Yeah, and try and give a heuristic argument why these really are the frequencies. So, you know, we said before that uh, it's not hard to show actually that all three of these functions are asymptotically equivalent. And by the prime number theorem, they're also asymptotically equivalent to pi of x. So I'm going to, this is Eric's idea, we're going to pick on the last one here and um, do a little algebra and see if we can pop out the frequency. So suppose we have a zero row, a non-trivial zero of zeta. Um, it's got a real part, alpha sub rho, an imaginary part, beta sub rho. If the Riemann hypothesis is true, then alpha sub rho is one half, right? Good. And uh, <clears throat> so we're, we're looking at that sum, so let's just look at a term. R of x to the rho would be x to the rho over the log of x to the rho, asymptotically. Um, rho is, just put in its real and imaginary parts, and we do a little work with the log to, uh, so that's rho log x. Um, so that's x to the alpha times x to three. And then if we just assume the Riemann hypothesis, then alpha, so rho is one half, so this is the square root of x over log x over rho log x times e to the i beta sub rho log x. And the sum, well, we can factor out the square root of x over log x, because that doesn't involve rho, so we pull that out of the sum. Right, we have to leave in the one over rho and the e to the i uh, beta sub log x. Yeah. yeah, oh, right, I didn't mention, the jump from here to here was just any exponential could be written in, the, in this form, so. Um, yes, and if we now subs let u equal log x, we have something that, to those of you who've seen Fourier series, particularly complex form, that looks a lot like a Fourier series. And if we use Euler's famous theorem that e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta, um, we see trigonometric functions and the possibility of Weibly. And in fact, the frequency is determined by beta sub rho. This is just an oscillating cosine, an oscillating which is our imaginary part. And so this is just a, a justification that the imaginary parts of the zeros determine the frequencies. Uh, yeah, I think we really feel that this was probably Riemann's motivation for his attack, that he really saw that he could, he was a master of Fourier, uh, Fourier analysis, complex analysis, which is one of the inventors of the modern theory. Um, Eric had pointed out that, gee, he's not using any advanced mathematics. He's just using the basics of a course in complex variables. But he was inventing the basics of the course in complex variables, he and Weierstrass at the time. So it was actually a tour de force of complex variables. It's a history. Anyway, I think we've said it here. So yes, if, if the betas were equally spaced, it really would be a Fourier series in, in log x, but it's not. But it's a lot like it in some ways. Yeah, so this is the music of the primes. Right? We even tried to mess with that a little bit, but we didn't get anything that sounded <laughs> good. This was a few years ago. But we have some new ideas for getting better compositions on that. OK, also in the paper, he made a number of conjectures about the zeros besides the Riemann hypothesis. First, in the strip, if you look between 0 and 1 and 
bound your rectangle by capital T, so you go up to imaginary part capital T, and you look at how many zeros are in that box, he said that asymptotically that was going to be T over 2 pi log T over 2 pi minus T over 2 pi, so that the number of zeros sort of grows like T log T. And he sketched a proof. It involved, he left steps out that involved estimating integrals that I believe nobody has quite succeeded in filling in. He was a master at estimating integrals. Um, but, other, but a proof was made in around 1900 by von Mangold. Yeah, somewhat different lines. Yeah. And uh, he also conjectured, or said, stated that the number of zeros that lie on the critical line in that rectangle is also asymptotically t over 2 pi log t over 2 pi minus t over 2 pi, which is certainly evidence that maybe they all lie on the line, but it certainly just suggests it. It's not. Uh, uh, he had even stronger reasons that we don't have time to go into for uh, believing this. He doesn't say whether he has a proof or not. To this day, it still hasn't been proven. Yeah, on n0, the second statement. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and he states and the Riemann hypothesis. So he makes these three conjectures, or three statements about the zeros. Yeah. OK. So quickly, yeah, no, we got it. Um, so some history on computing zeros. So 1895, Hadamard just showed that there were none on the line real part equal 1. And because of Riemann's functional equations, that means they're not on the line real part equals zero either. They all lie in the interior of the critical strip. That was enough to prove the prime number theorem. Mm -hmm. And he did. And so did a uh, Belgian mathematician, Delay Lale Poussin, at the same time. <laughs> in terms of actual arithmetic, in 1903, British mathematician Graham, using a nice technique, which maybe some of you will learn someday, euler maclaurin summation showed that the 10 zeros below t equal 50. He found the first 10 um, all lie on the critical line. I don't know how he actually did the arithmetic in terms of calculators or what of the day, but um, I wouldn't want to have had to do that. Um, yes, in 1905, von Mangold actually proved this. I said, uh, not quite along the lines sketched by Riemann, but he proved it. Um, 1914, Hardy proved that there are infinitely many zeros on the critical line. But he didn't get an asymptotic uh, uh, yeah, representation. Um, yeah, more arithmetic in 1915, extending Graham's methods. Backlon pushed it out to 200. And we're at 10 to the 13th now, so I, we could ignore these. Um, Hardy and Littlewood. Um, in 1921 showed that it grows at least as fast as a linear function, the number of zeros less than t, at least as fast. So that, of course, would also imply that there are infinitely many, but it's a little better. He has at least some asymptotic bound. Um, <clears throat> the last of the really um, hard um, arithmetic, um, they pushed it out to 300. OK, so this brings us to Riemann's paper with 10 minutes to go. So uh, to Siegel's paper. This is Siegel's source. Riemann's Nachlass, there are, I managed to now ha I now have a, a digital copy of the 168 pages on prime numbers. Ah, oh, yes, Nachlass, thanks. Yes, that's the collection of papers left after a professor dies. Um, they take. The first, you know, the stuff that's ready to be sent out, and somebody goes over those, and they publish those. They do some work on some others. The people who did this for Riemann were Dedekind, Heinrich Faber, Klepsch. These were great mathematicians who were uh, working on it. But they didn't make any, nobody made any headway with his rough personal notes that were left, um, except for sorting them. Dedekind and Faber managed to sort them out, number of pages somewhat ad hoc, some, some perhaps not. And uh, this is what it looks like, you know, grease stains, coffee stains, wine stains, you know, <laughs> scribbles, shopping lists, arithmetic <laughs> computations. Uh, 
just like yours or mine, those of them hopefully nobody's going to gather mine up and uh, put them in the archive at Göttingen. OK, so yeah, we'll come back to Siegel. I think I won't bother with this quote much. But he, but he says, they're a mess. You know, They're fragments of formula. There's hardly ever a whole equation written. Things are scattered. Um, but there's some serious mathematics in there. And then Harold Edwards commenting on Siegel's work. Harold had, um, had also looked at the, uh, went to Göttingen, so this would have been in the 60s, I think, and looked at them. And uh, he says, yeah, so he says, the difficulty of Siegel's undertaking could scarcely be exaggerated. And then he goes on, and talks about what he saw, but also, and one went, what, wonders whether anyone else would ever honor have unearthed this if Siegel hadn't. And Siegel was a great mathematician and a great number theorist and a great analyst. And he was a great historical scholar. He loved to read things in the original. And uh, I don't know that anyone else could have done this. And uh, I mean, the Riemann Siegel formula would have been rediscovered eventually because it's natural to try and find an asymptotic expansion. Uh, anyway, this is the top half of that page. And that page wasn't just one drawn at random out of the 168. This contains big pieces of the Riemann Siegel formula. Okay. But I won't point them out now because we'll keep moving. Okay. <laughs> but we'll, we'll get there. So, as I said, with five minutes to go, we can try and state the Riemann Siegel formula. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Yes, and what the Riemann Siegel formula is, is an asymptotic series. So it's a series that provides very, uh, very accurate computations for large values of the argument, as opposed to, say, Taylor series, which you learn in calculus, which can be used to provide very accurate estimates for values near where you expand it. And, uh, and there are other contrasts between them, but we'll just move along now. He state uh, Riemann stated the Riemann Siegel formula in terms of three functions that he defined in those notes. Okay, the uh, they called theta of t, m of t, and delta of t, and a sequence of smooth functions, coefficient functions, the C's. They're functions of delta, but delta is a function of t, so everything depends on t. And by t, we're thinking of the imaginary part of a zero of the zeta function. So t is our parameter to run along the critical line. Okay. Um, and so here's the Riemann Siegel formula. It says that, uh, yeah, this is what we want to compute. It's used to compute zeta of 1 half plus i t. Um, just to make things look nicer, we have this e to the i theta of t here. It's also. I guess I've written that way is real, why it's written on the critical line. Why is it far from a right. important? And the uh, asymptotically, right, so this is asymptotically equal to this. This is this finite sum of trig functions okay, is the principal term. It gives you the big piece of, uh, and then we have you know, minus one to the n minus one, just alternating signs. And this is, uh, S itself right, is a series, and that's what the C's were about. They are the coefficients of S. And S is a series in reciprocal powers of the square root of T, which is classic for an asymptotic series. For very large values of T, the reciprocal powers are small, and you're adding small things. The bad news for asymptotic series is they're <coughs> divergent usually. This one is, though that wasn't proven until 1995. Um, but, but what happens is, as you add terms, it gets better and better, and sometimes extraordinarily accurate. And then, as the terms start to grow, you lose accuracy. So if you stop at the right point, and there are good guidelines for doing that, you can get fantastic approximations to the value of the function that you want. And um, it's the main tool for doing such things. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so 
of course, the question is, well, okay, what's theta, what's m, what's delta, and what are the c's? And that's what um, Riemann had sorted out in that mess, and Siegel had actually presented in his paper. And so we'll just, I'll mention that theta is defined in terms of the gamma function. It isn't computed this way because the gamma function for complex variables isn't so nice to compute either. But there's an asymptotic series to compute it that gets you tremendous accuracy and very quickly. So you want to compute e to the i theta of t zeta of 1 half plus i t. You first use this to estimate theta of t. Then you, um, then, uh, so that's theta of t. m of t is the floor, the greatest integer, less than or equal to the square root of t over 2 pi. Delta of t is uh, built out of m. Um, I think looking at it this way here, it's the square root of pi times the fractional part of the square root of t over 2 pi. So the part between the greatest integer function and the square root of t over 2 pi, minus 1 half, and it's a sawtooth. So those are these, and yeah, moving quickly, this sum now, I already talked to, yes, it differs a little from a classic asymptotic series in that instead of constants, like say for Sterling's series for the log of gamma or something, these are functions of t, but they're not varying a lot, and it works a lot like a, um, a classic asymptotic series. Um, Yes, so I've heard you guess Barry, 1995. Um, so the C's, we're finished if we can say what the C's are. And uh, the paper and the derivation of, of this are just fantastic, but to, it's a three hour talk all by itself. Anyway, Riemann introduces this function um, after a certain amount of work. Uh, Siegel uh, presents it to us. and. Uh, this is a nice, smooth trigonometric function. Okay. Not quite smooth because of delta itself has. Um, but at, yes, what Riemann got was the C's in terms of the derivatives of f. So C0 of delta is f of delta. C1 is, involves the third derivative. And they're basically linear combinations of the derivatives of f. The whole derivation is intricate, beautiful, um, but yeah, just a little bit about working with something like that Nachlas, which really did take at 1930 someone like Siegel to do. Here's Siegel's version. He cleans up, he rescales things, he does a few things to uh, get it pretty nice. This is a piece of that page we were looking at before, which is essentially C4, as it appeared in Riemann's uh, Nachlas, and uh, it's in his rough notes in particular. Um, and if we do just a little algebra with this, pull out some factors of pi, evaluate i squared is minus 1, i to the fourth would be plus 1. If we do that, we have this here. Okay? So this is just Riemann's cleaned up a little bit to look a little closer to what Siegel had. And notice that uh, we've set this up so we can kind of compare term by term. So for C4, the 12th derivative term, <laughs> Riemann's little f is a little different from Siegel's big F rescalings and stuff. That's where the two pi is. But, it's kind of, but we have the same rational coefficients, same for the eighth, same for the fourth. I keep thinking that's the sixth. Um, but C goes one over two to the fifth. Riemann is, well, who's right? Siegel is right. So even Riemann, you know? In case you feel bad about making mistakes all the time. <laughs> Even Riemann um, made them. And uh, OK.
OK, I have a few more historical things to say. No more mathematics if anyone wants. But we could wrap it up, and you can come up and see more or ask more questions. <laughs> Great. Great.